afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Noah Rafford. I'm the Chief Operating Officer and the Futurist in Chief for the Government of Dubai. And our role in the Dubai Future Foundation is to help work with all of the government departments and the state-owned industries, including the utilities, the airlines, the major real estate developers, to help to understand how their sector is changing over the next 20 years and develop partnerships and projects which help them get ahead of that change. As you know, the United Arab Emirates and Dubai, as a country, is less than 45 years old. In that time period, it has gone from having only 45 college graduates in the entire country to having one of the highest literacy rates and education rates in the region, from having practically no roads to having the world's busiest airport and one of the best airlines and one of the top five ports in the world, uh, and to having practically Stone Age levels of poverty to having one of the highest GDP per capita uh, anywhere on Earth. Uh, now, all of this transformation has been driven originally by the discovery of oil. That has uh, been rapidly changing over the last decade in particular. And so while oil and petroleum constitutes about 30% of the total GDP, that amount is going down every year due to diversification. And what's important about this is that the leadership of the United Arab Emirates is deeply committed to a transformative vision of the future, one which understands the changes which are affecting public sector utilities, public sector industries, government itself, and transforming it such that it can be a truly a 21st century country and organization. And this quote by one of the leaders, this is Sheikh uh, Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, reflects that commitment. Now think about this in your own context. If 30% of your entire revenue comes from, let's say, one customer or one source of revenue, and you are committing your entire business to getting off of that 30%, that's kind of a scary transition. So this quote says, we look forward to celebrating the day when we ship our last barrel of oil. This is kind of profound, right? That's like saying, I look for, if you're selling computers, you're saying, I look forward to the day when I don't sell any more computers. This is a fundamental admission that the world is changing and we need to change our way of interacting with it so that we can create a new future for your company, for your country, for your city, and for your people. So as you heard throughout the rest of the day, uh, throughout today, there's a lot of pressure affecting industries such as utilities, and the natural human and organizational response to pressures of change is defense. Try to focus on your core competencies, try to cut costs, try to really focus on the things that you know. And what I would like to suggest to you that actually one of the things that is more effective in the context of transformative change is not defense, but offense and offense in an optimistic and proactive way. And I'm just going to show you some examples of how our Electricity and Water Authority, the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority, that is one of our board members and co-owners, is trying to deal with this transition in an aggressively optimistic, forward-looking way. So DIWA generates all the electricity, desalinates all the water, is responsible for the, the building of the infrastructure, the operation of the infrastructure, and all of the uh, financing that is involved with that. But it's very much a system in transition, both in terms of its core function today, but more importantly, and this is the essence of the message I would like to leave with you, in its very purpose, its purpose as a utility, its role in the economy and society is changing. So today, DIWA is deeply committed to investing in renewable resources, particularly solar energy. Currently, there's over 260, mil, uh, 260 megawatts of solar power online. We have 800 megawatts planned by 2020. And the goal is to have about 7% of all electricity generated from solar in 2020. But within 10 years after that, increase that to 25%. And by 2050, have 75% of all of the country's power generated by solar and renewables. So you can see this is quite an aggressive ramping up and transformation of the function of power generation. There's deep investigation in energy storage. We've heard many of these examples already today. Large-scale utility batteries being tested right now, neighborhood-scale trials, individual home trials, trying to understand what is the right approach to linking energy storage with solar energy and renewables. And then there's a large-scale effort trying to create smart grids, everything from smart meters in the home to dynamic load forecasting, load balancing, a deep commitment to open data and sharing of the data with other uh, government partners and private sectors, uh, entities, and ex interest, extremely interesting explorations going on in blockchain and distributed ledgers right now, which are part of our overall blockchain strategy in Dubai, which commits the government of Dubai to having 100% of its government transactions on a blockchain by 2020. 
Now, why is this important, right? It's important that we pay attention to the, the, our ability to do our core job, but more importantly, Diwa is understanding it's going to have a changing purpose. Its role in the future is going to change. There are other issues than just, say, providing a power and electricity that we need to be thinking about in the 21st century. Some of these issues are the influence of artificial intelligence and robotics on the labor market in particular. There was a study which came out of MIT uh, last year which looked at the economy of the United States from 2000 to 2017 and found that the introduction of one robot was equivalent to replacing over five and a half jobs. So one robot replaces five and a half jobs. And they are forecast to have 25% increase in automation in the United States just in the next two years. So you're talking about three million jobs going to robots, right? And if you compare that to other international partners like uh, Korea or Japan, there are already three times more robots in use today in Asia than there are in North America. So you're talking about trying to understand this vast, this vast automation gap, which is going to fundamentally transform the labor markets and raise significant questions about, well, frankly, what do people do, right? How do we value people in society if it's not from selling their labor? You might have heard of this thing called climate change. It's a really big deal. This figure, 400 parts per million of CO2, was the point at which most climate scientists agreed that if we crossed 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we would face irreversible, potentially catastrophic climate change. Well, that happened last year, right? There's more CO2 in the atmosphere right now than in the history of recorded uh, humanity. And even if we stopped emitting CO2 right now, we are pretty much guaranteed to face between two and a half and three degrees centigrade warming, which means that we've lost the fight against climate change, and our entire professional lives and our children's lives are going to be spent dealing with the consequences. Already today, wildfires are twice as large and twice as frequent as they were uh, a century ago. There's a size the state of Maryland burning in the United States as we speak already. Floods are four times as intense and four times more expensive, and food and water is going to become significantly more expensive in the coming years. All of this is driving profound social and political unrest. So when we're talking about a 20-year horizon, how are we understanding how our industry is going to change over 20 years? We cannot ignore the social and political challenges that the automation and its impact on the labor force, and climate change and its impact on our ability to pay for our foods and basic services is going to have on the social and political system. The OECD estimates that we're going to face between 150 and 250 million refugees in the next 30 years. Now, I think this is important because let's just think about today, right? There are 12 million Syrian refugees, of which only two and a half or three million made it to Europe, and the pressures that that brought politically basically broke Europe. So this is going to increase on an order of a hundredfold in the next 20 years, and it's urgently desperate that we need to understand and prototype new political systems, new economic systems, and new social systems that can handle the realities that we are going to face. So the question is, what role does utility play in this larger context? One of automation, one of climate change, and one of social and political transition. How can we reimagine the utility of the future? And this is what we're trying to do in Dubai right now. So Diwa is reconceiving of itself not as, frankly, a 19th century idea of an organization that does uh, the very basic things of providing electricity and water to the population, but actually as an artificial intelligence service provider itself. They recently opened a large data center called Moro. It's a top-tier data center, has over 500 server farms in it. They're providing artificial intelligence solutions for their customers and for the customers of other government uh, departments. Already they serve around 200,000 customer requests a month. They're using this for hashing blockchain, and, and not Bitcoin, but blockchain solutions as part of the larger distributed ledger approach to uh, decentralized systems in Dubai. And they're using this for large-scale data analytics processing. So this is kind of interesting because normally you would think a telecoms company would do this, or a company like Google would end up focusing on creating AI data centers. This is the utility service doing this. It's exploring issues around how we grow our food. In the UAE, we import about 85% of our food and desalinate about 90% of our water. Well, that's not very sustainable. So what role could a 21st century utility play in providing these services? So we're experimenting with all sorts of urban farming solutions, large-scale, small-scale, mobile, neighborhood-based. And these are, use about 99% less water 
almost half less energy, and are 100 times more productive. So what if utility per itself began to become a producer of food and resources? And lastly, echoing some of the sentiments of some of the earlier speakers, we're looking at how can we work with and learn from nature to create ge genetically engineered factories that, that create fresh water out of the ocean around us. This is a speculative giant jellyfish. It's combining the genes of jellyfish with the genes of mangrove roots. Jellyfish is nature's most absorptive natural material, and mangrove roots are, are natural desalinators. So if you could combine these and scale these up into a mile-wide jellyfish that sucked salt water from the ocean around it, purified it, turned it into fresh water, and then pumped it back to shore, you're developing an entirely new ecosystem, literally, around the provision of these services. So fundamentally, the Dubai Electricity and Water Authority is reconceiving of itself with the goal of becoming a 100% autonomous organization. Right now, it has about 9,000 employees. What if it only had nine? Right? The provision of basic utilities is something we just pretty much solved in the 19th century. It's the 21st century now. Right? How can we do this differently? How can we harness exponential technologies? How can we ride Moore's law, which says that the processing power doubles and the cost halves every 18 months, to start to focus on more important things? Not just delivering electricity and water to people's door. Yes, that's important. But actually, it's the 21st century, right? We have reusable rockets right now. We have supercomputers in our pockets. This is kind of an easy problem. What are the really important things which we could be focusing on where we reimagine the role of utility in a society, in a city, in an economy that is actually starting to look at these dangerous and exciting 21st century challenges? Now, this approach is kind of interesting because as opposed to the traditional approach to handling change management over time, this is a fundamentally proactive approach to this. So as we're facing the pressures of change, instead of trying to focus on your core competencies and explore best practices and minimize costs, right, this is actually emphasizing proactive experimentation with peripheral spaces, with new opportunities, with things which you didn't normally consider yourself having anything to say or do as a utility service. It's also what I like to call aggressively life-affirming. Truthfully, it's more exciting to explore new applications of your technology, to get your staff and your company and your industry excited about trying new things, right? It's not just about trying to do some marginal improvement on what you already do. Frankly, that's pretty boring. And when we're talking about 21st century competition for attention, for talent, for young people, for relevancy, if you do not have a visionary story for the role that your utility plays, for the reason that you are waking up in the morning and going to work, for the reason that you're asking people to give you your money beyond simply, I help you turn the lights on and you have water when you turn the tap, right? then you're going to be increasingly irrelevant. So this approach to large-scale, bold experimentation is actually quite exciting. It's inspiring. It makes young people want to come and work with you. It makes startups want to do business with you. It makes people want to actually pay attention to you. And that, almost more so than the basic provision of, of, of electricity and water, is the single most important thing which I think we face in the 21st century. Because what I'd like to leave you with is the utility of the future is not a utility. Right? It's not the way we understand it to be today. It can be so much more because we have so much more important things to worry about in the coming 20 years. So I want to thank you and I want to commend you for exploring these exciting ideas as we move forward and invite you to come to Dubai. And if we have an opportunity to work together, I look forward to getting to know you and building a future together. Thank you.